Today, you'll learn three story-driven editing techniques used by some of the greatest film editors. If you're ready, let's jump on in. So before we start, the editing techniques that you're going to learn in this video are less about creating a cool effect for the sake of creating a cool effect, but more about how you can use the technique to shape your story and capture your audience. Now, you may not be able to perfect the timing right off the bat, and that's okay. Oscar-winning editors go through many, 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 many iterations before it gets to that final edit. So after this video, you'll learn about what goes into making each editing technique great, and then you'll start to notice and absorb how the pros use it in popular films, TV shows, and even YouTube videos. And then eventually you're going to start applying it to your own work as well. So enough with the rambling here, let's get into the first editing technique, cross-cutting. Cross-cutting basically means cutting back and forth between two different sequences or scenes at the same time. Or the editor can cut together two different scenes to make it look like they're happening at the same time, only to reveal at the end that they were actually completely different in time periods. So there's a lot of fun you can have with cross-cutting. A popular use of cross-cutting would be something like a phone call scene. Cutting back and forth between the two perspectives could be referred to as cross-cutting. But cutting back and forth between different scenes isn't anything special, but you can use the technique to build up tension. For example, instead of a normal phone call between Bob and his wife, Sarah, on a Sunday afternoon, we can put Bob in a very dire situation that Sarah doesn't know about. So the conversation could sound totally normal, but every time you cross cut to Bob's perspective, the contrast of their lives make the phone call more engaging and hook the viewer into the story. Christopher Nolan's film editors are masters at cross cutting. If you watch any of his films, you will see that the cross cutting just keeps getting better and better. As a writer, he's great at establishing multiple situations happening at the same time while amping up the tension of each situation each time the movie cuts to it. For example, how about Dunkirk, where the film is constantly cross-cutting between three different timelines that eventually meet up at the end. Or Tenet, a movie that plays with the idea of going back in time and literally the editing has the characters walking backwards. So in Tenet, the cross-cutting between time going forward and backwards kind of makes it a little bit confusing, but it's really satisfying to the viewer once you understand what's going on. So enough explaining, let's actually do it. So jumping into Premiere Pro here, I've imported some stock footage for our mock-up scene. So the idea here is to cut between a peaceful dinner party where our suspect, the guy, is having dinner to then cutting to the police being notified of the suspect's location and for them to, of course, engage pursuit of the suspect. So doing this does two things. It makes us, the viewer, know information that the people in the film at the dinner party scene do not know which is a way of capturing your audience's attention. And then it also makes us nervous for the safety of the woman in the dinner party scene. So I have all the footage laid out in the timeline here. And a quick tip here is to label the clips from the different sequences, different colors. For example, I use purple for all the dinner party scenes and orange for the police scenes. And I even put them on different video tracks here to make it easy to know which clip correlates with which scene. We can create tension and contrast first with sound effects. So for all the dinner scenes here, I'll make sure it feels peaceful with some fire crackling sounds, some general table dinner sounds, and I'll add some reverb effects to this whole audio track here to make it sound like it fits the location better. And for the police shots, I want to create more contrast to this. So I'm going to be adding louder ambient sounds, police sirens, and just overall a more intense vibe. I also added reverb to the siren sound here to make it feel like it was farther away. But instead of adding reverb to the audio track itself, like I did with the dinner sounds, I'm going to add it to the sound effects clip itself because I want the cut from the police scene here to the dinner scene to feel more abrupt to fit the intense vibe of the sequence. 
by the way, if you want more details on how to use reverb to help sound effects fit your scene, you can watch this video later on. So to help transform our narrative to create this tension, we need to add some music. And to make this even more challenging, I'm gonna show you how you can use two different songs at the same time. So I've licensed these two tracks from Musicbed. So the first one, Piano Quintet Number no. 1 and Bloomsbury by Rera, will play on the dinner scenes. And the second track here, The Atrocities by Heretic, will be playing throughout the whole scene to set the scene. So for the first tracks, I'm going to be adding a reverb to all of them here using the room preset. Then let's add the parametric equalizer effect with its old radio preset. And then finally, I'm going to pan all of them to the right. So all these effects are going to make it sound like the song is coming from a speaker off the frame. And this song will help create kind of a peaceful mood to all of the dinner scene, which will then provide a great contrast with the feeling of our next track. So towards the beginning of this sequence, I'll add in parts of the second song that are more spaced out. This is going to leave room for the first song to shine through while also making you feel like something's wrong. So towards the end, I'm going to use a more intense part of this song. But when we cut back here to the dinner scene, it gets a little messy with two tracks playing at the same time. So to fix this, I'm going to add the parametric equalizer effect to our second track. And in the settings, let's turn on LP and let's move it to the left to cut out the high frequencies. Do this until you can hear the piano from the first track better, while also keeping the energy from the low frequencies. So after all that work, let's see the final result. Calling all units, he's been found. So as you can hear, adding those two songs really helped create that tension that we wanted in the crosscut edit. It really transformed just a sequence of random clips into something that had emotion because that's the point, right? To create that feeling and energy to enhance the viewer's response. And that's what editing stories is all about. It's about creating that emotion and half of the picture is sound. So music is super important to creating that feeling. So ever since using Musicbed, it's just been so much easier to find songs that capture that emotion and feeling and tone that I'm going for for my ideas and stories. And Musicbed has a huge collection of top quality tracks from talented artists whom, by the way, I listen to regularly on Spotify because it's that good. And Musicbed created this innovative search tool. It's an AI powered search by song, which looks up actual real songs that you know, so you can find one similar from the Musicbed library. For example, the tracks that I found earlier in this edit were found using this feature. And this narrowed down the search quickly so I could find that winning track so I could go and complete my edit faster. So if you're like me and you wanna find music that helps you create more deeper and meaningful stories, try it out. Make the switch to Musicbed. You can use my link below to get a 14 day free trial. Thanks so much to Musicbed for sponsoring this video and supporting what we do here. And now let's get on to the next editing technique. So you might've heard the term show don't tell when it comes to filmmaking, which basically refers to the idea that you wanna visually show the viewer what's going on instead of directly telling them 
because it's just more engaging, right? But in the world of YouTube and online content creation, I would argue that it's important to show and tell at the same time. Let me give you an example. Check out the intro of this Johnny Harris video. This is what a $25 million a year salary looks like versus a $25,000. What if the intro was like this instead? Let's take a look at the difference between $25 million salary versus a $25,000 salary. So my intro got the point across because we all know that 25 million is a lot more than 25,000, right? But the way that Johnny Harris and his team use CGI to illustrate how big that pile of money is using him as the scale comparing it to 25,000 just makes it more compelling, right? You can see the same thing going on with Mr. Beast when he's comparing the actual amount and size of certain things in his videos. Having that visual there just helps get the point across and gives the viewer something visually to look at that keeps them engaged and hooked into the story. Although I've talked about Johnny on the channel before, if you do not know him, he used to work for Vox, but now he runs his own journalistic YouTube channel. And he's amazing at visualizing. And unlike, you know, your typical news story format where it just starts with somebody talking about the issues going on, he actually shows what's going on and brings the viewer into the situation before then talking about it, which is a great way to hook in your viewer. A good way that I apply the same process to my own educational videos is in the intro when I'm talking about what you're going to learn, I also show what you're going to learn as well. For example, I can give a sneak peek of the end result of what we're going to create so the viewer knows what's happening, or I can actually show the final effect in a skit style format. For example, in the video I did on horror editing effects during Halloween, I opened it up with a skit of what we will be creating. And obviously this doesn't apply just to the intro, but for any moment in your video that could benefit from having something visual to make it more engaging. This is where stock footage or animations can come in handy. And one more point about why the intro is important is now that the YouTube autoplay has come into effect. It used to be all about the thumbnails and getting people to click, but if you hover over a video now, it actually starts to autoplay the video. So it's important to factor in what visuals are there that can help capture that viewer to then, okay, I actually want to click on this and see what's going on. So all important things to think about. All right, now let's go on to the next one, eye trace. Eye trace is one of the most important fundamentals of both filming and editing, but it's often overlooked. It's kind of a pun, isn't it? Eye tracing from an editing perspective is being aware of where you want your audience to be looking in your shot and making sure that it's easy for them to follow or divert their attention. Let's start off with a very bad example of eye tracing gone bad with this example here from the fight scene from Taken 3. The fight scene looks like it was shot well, big budget, well choreographed, but there's just so many cuts, it's hard to know what the heck is going on. All right, this time I'm going to circle where the filmmakers expect you to focus in each shot. So here, seeing the focus point jumping around constantly just shows that the eye trace is not something they had in mind while they were editing this. The worst part is how many cuts there are and the character keep getting switched from left to right to right to left. It's hard to keep track of where the bad guy is. With all that said, I'm not saying you need to have the focus point always in the same spot, but it does help when there are a lot of cuts in faster sequences, right? But you can also change the viewer's focus to create unexpected expectations. This is why jump scares work so well in horror films. For example, you can have multiple shots where the characters can be doing things on the right side of the frame and then cut to a shot where the ghost is visible on the left side. The key here is to give the viewers enough time to find a new focus point in the new shot. And if you get the timing just right, you can do a more subtle jump scare without having to, you know, have that huge in your face jump scare all the time. 
This reveals another thing to keep in mind is the pacing of your cuts. You want to make sure that you give the viewer enough time to see what's going on. As we saw with Taken, the cuts were just way too fast. I think somebody commented there was like over 260 cuts in this really short scene, which is a lot. We can move our eyes fast, but when each cut is, you know, less than a second, it's hard to keep up and find the next focus point. I mean, just looking at the comment section on this video, pretty much explains what is wrong with this scene. So we know the bad examples. Now let's take a look at a good example of eye trace. And by the way, I got these examples from this article by Derek Liu. Definitely recommend the read. I'll put a link down below. Let's take a look at this launch trailer for the game Celeste. The way that they used eye trace is perfect for showing off a platforming styled game. Watching this feels like you're always looking at the right thing because whoever edited this made sure that the focus point of the last shot matched up with the next shot. Or what about the 2015 film Mad Max Fury Road? This movie is famous for always putting what they want you to focus on in the middle of the frame. So as long as you look at the middle, you're going to know what's going on, which just creates a pleasant viewing experience. Now there's not one right way to eye trace in your video. It's just about making sure that you're pointing your viewer in the right direction. And maybe the point is to disorient the viewer. Maybe you want the point of view to be somebody who is maybe took a candy or is out of it. And the perspective is from this person and you can't focus on what is going on. In that case, you want the eye trace to be confusing to show that perspective of the subject in the film. Many different ways to approach it. And talking about eye tracing for my own videos here on YouTube, what we try to do is if we're cutting from my talking head to then my computer screen showing something, I try to show the computer screen the point of focus where my talking head was before. So it's easy for the viewer to see what we're trying to show them right away. Or if I cannot have it be in the center where my talking head was, and it has to be in the upper right, we will hold on that widescreen and then have an arrow or a graphic that pops up and hold that long enough to divert the viewer's eye point so they can see what's going on before we cut to the next part. And the technique always doesn't have to be fancy either. You can always just hold on that widescreen for the viewer to find what they need longer or you can create a mask and darken all the unnecessary areas so people are driven to the lighter parts. You can play with color as well. There's many different ways to approach it. So keep these story-driven editing techniques in mind next time you're working on your project. And I promise you, it's going to be next level. If you want to learn more useful editing techniques, you can click on this video right next to me. And remember, all these tricks work best if you're using it to help enhance the story that you're trying to tell. And as always, keep creating better video with Gal. See you next time. Bye. Ooh.